Welcome to Conversations with IFS, with me, your host, Kimaima Nunu. Conversations with IFS is brought to you by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and the curator is Mr. Iva Ajimandia. Today's conversation is with a high-flying, high-achieving, very successful woman. She is a graduate of the London School of Economics. She's also a Fulbright Fellow of Harvard University and holds a master's from Oxford University in the UK. She is currently a board member of Fidelity Bank and also has been a former NDPC commissioner. She is a former lectures lectured at the University of Ghana and also is the founder and first director of the Human Rights Centre of the University of Ghana. Very, very, very many accolades to her name. She is currently the CEO and founder of the Heritage and Cultural Society of Africa and is Ghana's former ambassador to France, Portugal and UNESCO. I'm talking of none other than Ambassador Johanna Swanaker and she'll be with us shortly after this break. Welcome back to Conversations with IFS. And our guest today is Johanna Svanica, Ambassador Johanna Svanica, Ghana's former ambassador to France, Portugal, and UNESCO. You're welcome, Ambassador Svanica. Thank you. Um, as I read in my introduction before, um, you are now the president and indeed founder of the Heritage and Cultural Society of Africa, HAXA. Um, what, what pushed you to establish HAXA? So the Heritage and Cultural Society of Africa, um, HAXA, um, was my idea whilst I was uh, the permanent delegate of Ghana to UNESCO. Um, from childhood, I've always wanted to be in the public service and indeed I'm passionate about development and leadership in Africa. And I feel that um, women should step up to the plate of leadership. And I also feel that if you want to develop your country, you don't necessarily have to be a politician. You, there are so many ways of um, being a leader in your community. Everyone can be a leader in their community. So this was my small way of figuring what I was passionate about and how I could help um, Ghana and the wider Africa to develop to its full potential. Mm. Okay, so what is HAXA about really? Yes. What, do you, what does it do? So um, HAXA tries to take advantage of our indigenous heritage and culture and use it for economic development. Mm. And uh, from where I sit, we, we, especially in Ghana, have a very rich heritage and culture. We actually have a living culture. So our festivals, our funerals, outdoorings, initiation, these are all living culture. Um, but unfortunately, because we live our culture, we don't preserve it, we don't document it, and we don't leverage it enough for the development of our country. So giving the example of France, where I was ambassador, um, drinking wine, drinking champagne is part of their culture. What have they done? They've sold that culture to the rest of the world. They've elevated it, they've branded it, and they're making very good revenue out of it. Mm -hmm. And you can go on and on with examples. Uh, in fashion, I don't know, Chanel, Louis Vuitton, um, these are 
huge contribution uh, contributors to France's uh, GDP and, and revenues. Um, cheese is another one. France is known very much uh, for its food, and cheese is one of the um, most popular items, which makes them a lot of money. So um, we have to understand that as we pursue um, manufacturing and industrialization, there are low-hanging fruit which we can pick, which are things which we have a comparative advantage for and which are part of our heritage and culture. So can you give us examples of these low-hanging fruits which we can maximize on yes. and export to the wider world? Mm. A perfect one is coconut. So coconut is very popular in Ghana. Wherever you go, you see um, um, like wheelbarrows full of coconut. If you travel, you see the coconut plantations, um, some of them just even occurring naturally. Coconut oil has now been identified as a superfood and coconut itself um, and is of very, very high value. Um, you also have coconut flour, which I use to bake uh, cakes and breads um, and which you can't buy in Ghana. So to get access to coconut flour, I have to um, order it abroad. Usually I order it on Amazon and um, it's very expensive. So it's very sad that this is a high value item mm -hmm. which could easily be processed in Ghana, but we, we don't really, um, it's not available. Um, chocolate is another one. We're making progress with chocolate. Chocolate is one of the most popular foods in the world. Mm -hmm. And many countries have branded chocolate as their own. So the French have their chocolate. They are known for their specific kind of chocolate. Of course, the greatest chocolate country is the Swiss. Um, Belgium, uh, Germany, they all uh, have very strong chocolate industries. But we produce the cocoa. We produce the um, premium cocoa. And we should be producing chocolate. We should be known for producing chocolate. So. Um, at the moment, AXA is working on creating a chocolate trail, um, which would be a, an experience when tourists come to Ghana to visit uh, Tetequashi's farm. I've been there, it's there, it's a tourist attraction, but nobody goes there. They even created a, a platform where you can host uh, a tour group and lecture them, tell them the story before you descend into the farm. They have the first tree which was ever grown and um, many different species. Once you leave the farm, you then go to a modern cocoa farm and you see the difference between the leaves and the plants of a modern cocoa plant and, and, and the original ones which were brought um, to Ghana. Uh, you get a chance, many people don't know that when you open a cocoa pod, it's white, they think it's brown. So you, you, know, you get a chance to look, cut open uh, a cocoa pod, see, the, the white seeds, taste them. Um, and then you go to the chocolate factory where you see the cocoa seeds or cocoa beans are roasted and then they are ground down and then they turn into cocoa liquor. There are so many um, different products which can be made out of cocoa. If you go to the Cocoa Research Institute of Ghana, they create, I think, up to about 30 different products out of the um, cocoa pod, um, out of the cocoa bean, um, they do cocoa liquor, soap, creams, cocoa butter, etc. But somehow it doesn't go forward Why? beyond, um, I think it's because of the challenge for the private sector. So they are, they are not private sector, they are a government agency, the Cocoa Research Institute. And therefore we have to move away from government models to the private sector. So, for example, um, in Tema, we now have an indigenous, indigenously owned cocoa factory, which is creating um, chocolate, um, both for the home market and for export. And it's a very interesting story. I came across it because I brought a delegation from France to Ghana. And um, the French, uh, one of the French companies had actually bought the factory of a Ghanaian who was doing very well. So um, this gentleman studied in the US and for his 
uh, MBA, he used developing a cocoa production um, facility in Ghana as his, um, his project. And when he finished, it was such a good project, he was encouraged to carry it out. But he came to Ghana and no bank would give him any money. So he went back to America and the equipment manufacturer was happy to give him the equipment and take equity in his business. And he quickly paid back. Um, they were happy to exit. They didn't really want to be part of cocoa production, but in, you know, in, in order to give him the equipment, they had to. Mm -hmm. And that's how he started. He did so well in record time, he built another bigger and be better factory. And um, the French bought then the smaller factory. So they only produced the liquor to export to their factories in Bordeaux to produce chocolate, but he is producing top quality chocolate in Ghana. So this is the kind of thing which needs to happen to move to the next level. Oh, that's, that's a very interesting success story. And um, what about other aspects of our culture that you think we should maybe invest in more, promote more, sell to the outside world? Absolutely. Um, so still staying on food, um, there's something called cocoa nibs, for example which we don't know in Ghana. The small... The yes, yes, they're ju basically the beans ground yes. down. Mm -hmm. And you, you can eat them. They're also a superfood. So we have so many superfoods here. Mm. And they, they're full of fiber, they're full of antioxidants, full of minerals, um, and they don't have the sugar of chocolate. So if you want to have the health benefits of cocoa without the sugar, and even sometimes uh, for some people, milk is not good either, mm. you can eat cocoa nibs. And these are also a product which we could be manufacturing and um, gaining revenue from. So um, food, uh, we, we, we already talked about France. The French make a whole song and dance about their food and it is good, but the Ghanaian food is also very good. When Ghanaians leave Ghana, they take their food along because they, they, they can't find anything better than what they are eating. And therefore, um, I feel very sad when I go abroad and I don't uh, see Ghanaian restaurants the way you do French or Chinese restaurants because I know that if we actually organized our food industry we could also be making a lot of money out of that and here in Accra when you have uh, business um, guests and they tell you we, we want to eat Ghanaian food it's sometimes a struggle to find somewhere to take them there's one or two very good places but by no means do we have first-class Ghanaian restaurants uh, scattered all over the country. And so this is something um, we should work with. Um, by the same token, there are a lot of small um, holder hotels and guest houses. And often they don't have the, um, the knowledge um, to bring their service offering to the standards, which will bring them in a lot of money. So both with the food and um, with hospitality, I think the government needs to put um, some effort into training because I think there's huge potential for employment in all sectors of heritage and culture, including tourism, which covers, you know, even tour guides. You know, we, we struggle to find tour guides for the tours that we do because um, it's just not really something which people are trained for in this country. But if we want to expand tourism, that is something we need to focus on. We need, what does a tour guide do? They tell a story. How do you sell anything? By telling a story. So if you tell people a story about your cocoa or your gold or your food, they are more likely to want to try it out, to want to buy it, to want to take a little piece with them when they go back home. When they go back home, people will ask them, where did you get um, this from? And then they can tell the story which was told to them when they came to the country. Okay. In terms of um, infrastructure to support, let's say, our tourism industry, how, uh, I mean, where, where are we now? I mean, it seems to me we don't have much organized um, very many organized tours or even places where we can really go and have that authentic Ghanaian tourist experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
Um, we actually have a lot of fabulous sites, okay? A lot of fabulous sites. Recently, um, a very interest, I had a very interesting experience. I was in the UK and um, so somebody told me he came to Ghana um, and it was so unfortunate there was nothing to see in Accra. And I said, yes, I do appreciate that there aren't many organized tours, but there's a lot to see in Accra. But it's a challenge because the, one of the biggest problems is washroom facilities. We have even World Heritage sites which don't have washroom facilities. We have sites which, when you arrive at, are locked. And even to get in is a problem. Um, so at the moment, I, I actually did the uh, Ashanti, uh, Ash yeah, Ash you can say Ashanti region because we went out of Kumasi. Um, so we, we do the research so that we can offer um, our guests the best, especially in terms of comfort, because you don't want to take people on a long tour and then when they need a washroom or they need to eat, you don't know where to take them. So you need to do that recce before taking people on the tour. And what we found out was um, a lot of the sites, and that applies to Accra as well, don't have any facilities whatsoever. No washrooms, nowhere to eat food, nowhere to get a drink. Um, and though that's the basic, if you want to do tourism, that's the basic. So one, one uh, experience was arriving, and people don't know this, but we have listed um, what is known as Ashanti traditional buildings as a world heritage site. Mm. And these are shrines, ancient shr shrines, many of them decorated in the most beautiful Adinkra symbols. Um, and uh, about six of them, which are in the Ashanti region. So we visited one of them, and when we arrived, it was locked. There was no sign to show uh, it was a World Heritage Site. And in fact, we went round. Um, we initially were misdirected to a museum which is being built uh, for Yas Antoa, or in honor of Yas Antoa, which I hope does get built. Um, so the people in the area themselves didn't know um, that this uh, thing was a World Heritage Site and couldn't direct us. Anyway, eventually, I think with the Satnav, we, we found it. When we arrived, it, it was locked. So then somebody in a kiosk had to go and bring the key um, to open it up. Um, and l needless to say, there were no facilities for tourists there. But of course, the shrine was there, and it was very impressive. And so I hope that uh, in future, um, we can build the infrastructure which goes together with an important site. We also went to um, the um, Bonri weaving site and the Ntonso weaving site. We were blown away by the creativity, the craftsmanship, but I was shocked, especially with Bonri. I'd heard a lot of about Bonri. I only found out about Ntonso when we did the research of where to go, but Bonri had heard a lot. I was even the ground to walk on is not safe, yes. There is, is very rocky and bumpy, no attempt at um, creating any kind of welcome area for tourists. Mm -hmm. You just arrive, kind of, you know, find your way and then go into um, the building where you can see them weaving the kente, but once you, you leave, that building, there, there didn't seem to be any kind no of facility, shop no shop, no washroom, no place to eat. And like I say, even walking on the ground was oh. difficult. Yeah. So I was a little disappointed because I had heard so much about Bonri. And I also felt that um, these, like we talked about low hanging fruit. This is just, a, it's a no brainer. Like. Um, if they separated the weaving area from the shop, I think people would actually buy much more. At the moment, you just have to go around um, negotiating with each weaver, which can be quite tedious. And I think um, it can be organized, uh, you know, in, in a more tourist-friendly way. Um, on to Intonso, uh, again, charming guy, 
um, we saw the dye being boiled. He showed us how you, you get it from seeds and then um, you, you, you boil it into an, uh, an ink and then it's used for stamping. He could also weave any kind of color, any kind of pattern of cloth and he demonstrated it. But we were the only tourists there on that day and the facilities, um, again, f to make tourists com comfortable we're not there. Now, it's about 40 minutes away from Kumasi. So if you go on a tour and you're going to be away for hours, you definitely need usable washrooms and somewhere to eat um, and, you know, just refresh yourself. So I think these are very, very basic things. Um, I know there's some work now going on um, at the Shire Hills, but that was another place which was of concern because it's such a fabulous resource. It's so close to Accra. Can you imagine once it's organized how much revenue the Shire Hills Game Resort can bring? Okay, so we'll take a quick break and we'll come back and discuss the potential of our heritage and culture, um, the potential it has on our economy. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Conversations with IFS, with my special guest today, Ambassador Johanna Swanica. Welcome back, Ambassador. Thank you. So we've just, in the previous section, we were talking about um, the whole heritage conversation and about um, tourism and culture, etc. And I was thinking of how can we make tourism, our cultural heritage, how can we make it count more in terms of state revenues? Absolutely. How can we generate more money from it? Yes. So I would like to use the example of gold. What is more desirable than gold? Okay. We are a country whose history is steeped in gold. So it was actually gold which attracted the first Europeans to Africa. And so Ghana is actually the first place they came to settle in search of gold. Um, then uh, we, unfortunately, that brought about this, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and after it was banned, we became a colony. We became a colony of the United Kingdom, or of Britain at the time. And we were named the Gold Coast. Um, now, a lot of cultural significance um, or you can find a lot of cultural significance in gold. So, for example, when I was in France, there was an exhibition in Bordeaux. They have uh, a slavery museum in Bordeaux. A lot of people don't know that, but Bordeaux was one of the largest uh, slave uh, ports in Europe. Um, and in the slavery museum, they did an exhibition on gold weights because so much time and um, craftsmanship had gone into designing gold weights uh, which were used in the trade. So of course, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, but other kind of, of trades as well. And um, so um, it was actually entitled Akan. And I, I think, um, you know, the Akan tradition straddles Ivory Coast and Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. So. Um, I think that was more of the inspiration, but um, we arranged for um, somebody from Ghana to come and attend uh, the exhibition and for Ghana to have a presence there. And many of the gold weights originated from Ghana. So other countries are doing things 
uh, with our heritage. Why can't we? Um, so the gold weights is just an example. I mean, you can think of jewelry and, uh, you know, the whole um, As Asante kingdom and the, the things they did with gold. And you can go on and on. In present day, we are still a gold mining country. In fact, gold mining is one of the most important uh, industries and one of the biggest revenue generators and also one of the biggest social problems. Um, and therefore, why aren't we leveraging on that for our tourism as well? Um, why don't we have a museum for gold? A country which was called the Gold Coast, a country which is known the world over for its gold. Um, we could have a place even for our own children where they go and learn about the history of gold, the um, contribution of gold to our economy, um, watch how gold is crafted. And for tourists, if they see all this here, you know, the, the wonderful stories, they are very likely to buy gold. I have bought gold in other countries. For, for example, Antigua, okay? Antigua has a cruise port. When they come off the cruise ship, they rush into the shops. What do they buy? Gold. And I don't think that gold is uh, mined in Antigua. Um, so it's again like the chocolate. We are producing the chocolate, but somebody is benefiting uh, from its processing and production. Um, likewise, all over the world, you can find, um, you know, souks or special markets where you can buy gold, where even Ghanaians would go. And in our own country, we, we don't have that. We have maybe a small shop um, at uh, PMMC. It's very impressive, but we could do more. So, um, it takes me to, to the other way we can generate income and another story. Um, so I'm on the board of Fidelity Bank and one of our advisory board members um, is a foreigner. Um, and he told me that we have people who travel from Europe and America to Ghana to join their cruise ship at Tema. But they don't see anything of Ghana they don't spend any money in Ghana. They just land at Kotoka International Airport because it's a, you know, it's a good place to connect. And they go uh, to, to their cruise ship in Tema Harbor and then they go on their um, tour of Africa or wherever they want to go. So that's also a problem because we need these people to stay in our country and spend some money either on tours or on things like gold, chocolate, arts and crafts, and other things. So that's typical, again, that is something which is low-hanging fruit, if they're coming anyway. Um, um, but to, 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 to tell you the truth, creating a, a, a cruise port is, is quite simple. We already have the harbor. Mm. You just section off an area for, for cruises. They're already coming anyway. It's just that they don't think of us as a destination. It's just, uh, they're just coming to, uh, for convenience, to refuel or to load the ship. But we could make ourselves into a destination for cruise ships. And then you create the um, commercial center which goes with that. And I don't know, I mean, cruise, sometimes you have 4,000 people coming off a cruise. They'll come and buy and go back. On, on, on the ship. But don't you think it's all linked into the way we brand Ghana? In mm -hmm. the way, if Ghana was seen more as, in, uh, instead of a transit place, mm -hmm. more of a place where actually, I, I'm curious, yes. I want to go and visit here. Exactly. I want to experience pieces of Ghana, or exactly. bits of Ghana. So how can we improve upon that? You, you are, you're very, very right. And um, I think successive governments have tried to brand Ghana um, and it's a work in progress. Um, I feel Ghana has a lot to offer, and so it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, and I want to, our true, or let's say our um, real-time brand at the moment is our football team. So let's talk about that. Um, I went to Singapore, went to the hairdresser, and when I told her I was from Ghana, she said, oh, football. You know, so, and it has happened to me so many times. You, 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 you go somewhere where you, people, often people don't even know 
who or where or what Ghana is. I've been to a place uh, in Kentucky in the US and when I said I came from Ghana, I said, which state is that, you know? <laughs> Um, they thought it was an, a place in, in the United States. But um, we, we need to um, brand, just as we are recognizable brand because of the World Cup. Mm. And, and that was work done by, you know, I guess the FIFA body. Um, we need to do that for so many other sectors because it's a bit annoying as well when you say you're from Ghana and the only thing people know is football. On the one hand, we need to leverage that and use that as a source of revenue. So again, we could have a football museum. Why not? Ghana is so well known for football. And it's not just um, externally. Internally, we are passionate about football. The world stops when Ghana is playing, yeah. for us anyway. So why don't we have a place where um, our young people can go and kind of revel in this glorious culture. Why are we always putting ourselves down? We're always nitpicking about what we don't do well. But when we do something well, no, nobody's um, celebrating it. Nobody is developing it into something, you know, useful um, and something which can bring us revenues. Even football shirts can bring you revenues. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you created a museum. Maybe you have statues of our famous players or a photo exhibition or something. Can you imagine how much they would be selling if tourists go there? Because tourists know that Ghana is a footballing nation. So in terms of branding Ghana, the same way Ghana football has been branded, mostly by you know just being on the world platform of the World Cup, we can brand other areas of what we, we do well. I'm noticing you're wearing lovely kente. Thank That's you. That's another way of indeed branding yes, ourselves. Yes, yes. You know? I love kente and I feel very sad. Um, so part of my role as ambassador, in, in my time, Ghana um, signed on to um, in the Intangible Heritage Convention. And I attended the uh, for the first time. Um, after we had um, signed the convention, um, a conference in Addis Ababa um, on intangible heritage. That year it was being held um, in Addis. And um, it was fascinating. And um, Ghana now has the opportunity to list things like kente or um, other objects of art or even food as intangible heritage. And that also puts a spotlight on, on the product. Mm -hmm. So in the, um, in the conference I attended, you would not believe that I think Belgium, Belgium listed beer. Beer, beer drinking. Mm. You know, and even you would think of Germany as the beer drinkers, but German, uh, Belgium listed beer making and drinking. And you can list anything. You can list, let's say, the depot ceremony, or you can list um, drumming and dancing of a specific type. You can list uh, kente cloth. And in fact, um, you can do joint listings as well. So I know um, that the Ivorians, who are much more steeped in, in, in this kind of, um, you know, elevating your, your country through um, UNESCO and through heritage and culture, um, they would be quite happy to do certain things with Ghana as a joint listing. And I'm sure Kente is one of them because you have Akans in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and they did approach me about music as well. Yeah. There's a specific kind of music which you can find um, in both countries. So th these um, kinds of things um, give you, uh, you know, a platform to stand on. It highlights the object at an international level, and then you can figure out how you can use it to to, to bring more revenue. But I I really feel strongly about kente because I feel like um, there's a lot of cu cultural appropriation going on. So if we don't value what we have naturally other people will take it use it and and make money with it i mean our music for example african music again ghana is a hub for music and um the way music evolves okay so we had what high life 
then we had hip life, now we have Afro beats, etc. Mm. So um, a lot, as you can imagine, the music industry is a billion dollar yeah. industry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, um, a lot of that money goes to the US because they have diaspora Africans, they have African Americans who um, have produced music which has African origins. So somebody else is benefiting from something we are not seeing as something which you can make money out of. Now, I know that our artists struggle to monetize what they do, um, but I think the tide is turning because with um, technology, now you can put your song on Spotify, I, uh, SoundCloud, so many other things. So our um, musicians who in the past had huge problems with copyright, um, etc., now can access um, international platforms and hopefully that will help them. But again, you'll be surprised. Governments do support their artists um, to, to and, and to tell you the truth, um, art and culture in Europe is funded by the state. Yeah. Okay. The to the extent that even, um, so you asked me how, why and how I set up Haksa, and one of the things which really pushed me was Ghana's 60th anniversary. So we had a Diaspora Homecoming conference for, for that, and uh, we had many interesting uh, musicians playing at, at our gala, and um, so as far as the Diaspora is concerned, you, you don't need to distinguish be, I mean, th there's no distinguishing between um, nations when it comes to music. Music is, is universal, they, they say, is the universal um, language. And therefore, we um, need to support our artists in the way that they are supported abroad. It's not by chance mm -hmm. that um, music and art are so um, elevated and bring revenues um, when the governments are supporting their artists. So um, the um, Lottery Fund in the UK funds art um, and culture. And the point I wanted to make is we had an exhibition for James Bano, who is a world-recognized photographer, somebody who, um, as far as I'm concerned, we haven't appreciated enough here in Ghana. Um, and he in the past um, received some funding from the UK lottery uh, to host an exhibition in England. It wasn't the Ghana government which funded the exhibition. It was the British government. They recognize our art and fund it be before we do. So we have to figure that out because once you give your artists um, that platform, then the, the, the world is the oyster and they are going to bring the revenues back home um, because that is also a way to um, export heritage and culture and even education. Now Ghana has a thriving export industry. People don't realize, but if we build high quality schools and people come from around the region to attend school in Ghana, then it, it means we are exporting education as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. We'll be right back after this break with more conversations on heritage and culture. Welcome back to Conversations with IFS, with me, your host, Jemima Nunu. Today we have Ambassador Johanna Swanica as our guest. Ambassador, 
We've spoken a lot about the cultural economy and I want your thoughts on what can be done or what should be done with regards to creating jobs in the sector of our economy. Yes, I'm glad you asked that because this sector has huge potential for job creation. Um, and uh, if you, so if you link it to some of the things we've talked about, agriculture, the food industry, hospitality, um, uh, dance and music. Um, so let's use the example of tourism. Somebody arrives, they go on a tour, they need a tour guide. They get to their destination, they need food and drink. Um, the food and drink links back to the things we produce in Ghana. We need to be serving them what we produce. And that's another way of exporting our food. Not only putting it on a ship or a plane, but offering it to people who are coming here and want to taste our food. So it's a pity that most of the top um, establishments often are serving foreign food and gets back to what I said that we need more Ghanaian restaurants serving Ghanaian food at the level at the quality hygiene sanitation all those things are very very important if you go to a site and there's no washroom there's no soap in the toilet there's no uh, towel then do you really want to eat the food no and you it may not be safe either so all these things are linked um, so then they sleep in hotels. Again, if we can bring, a lot of people don't like large chain uh, hotels. They want hotels with character, hotels which make them feel that they've come, they can't be just anywhere in the world, but they've come to somewhere special which has its own character. Um, and I think um, we have a lot of small holding hotels. This is the way of uh, you know, creating employment within communities. So within the hotel, there are those who prepare uh, the food, there are those who clean the rooms, there are those who do the entertainment. A lot of um, hotels do drumming and dancing or have the potential. People come, they want to see the culture. So then you have um, opportunities for performers. Um, and you know, you, you can go on and on and on. When we come to uh, food processing, it's the same. I want uh, a steady um, supply of coconut flour. I can't get it. We can have micro industries creating coconut flour. You just dry the coconut and mill it, just like you do with corn. Um, and uh, you create a whole new industry. And if you do it well, you can export it as well. So there's a lot of opportunity in the kinds of foods that we have here and we take for granted, but people don't uh, know out outside Ghana or outside Africa. Um, I gave the example of the cocoa nibs, for example. These are things which in our local market we are not aware of. So there's a whole market out there to sell cocoa nibs to Ghanaians and, and to Africans and um, beyond, abroad as well. Um, and all these little, little industries will create jobs. They, um, whilst I was in France, they have a salon de chocolat, so it's a chocolate fair. And I threw myself into it with a passion because the first year um, I was so actually embarrassed at our stand compared to other, you know, especially other African stands. The Ivorians um, were basically having a party in their stand and, and I was um, looked kind of sad and abandoned. Um, so we worked very hard to, and in the end, we were the best stand in, in our sector. But um, I, I advocated to bring private chocolate makers. Two ladies came um, and they make artisanal chocolates. And now when I call them, they are busy. They're too busy. They have so much demand for their chocolates. Internationally? Every, yes. In fact, one of them, as we speak, is in the U.S. Yes. And I, I said, you know, I, I need some chocolate. And so she, she's fulfilling demand in the U.S., you know. So um, there's, 
there's so much opportunity to expand some of these things. The textile factory, um, the textile industry, and um, the sewing industry is another one. Um, so I have tourists who come and say, "Oh, I like your fabric. Um, can I have something made?" Okay, we we are planning um, uh, an another conference next year. Next year is 400 years since um, the slave trade began and we feel it needs to be commemorated in a positive way um, by bringing people, people who are disconnected uh, from their communities back home, welcoming them and celebrating the progress which they have made and we have made. Mm -hmm. And so it would be another Haksa um, event and one of the things I want to um, kind of pioneer is that when you have a conference, an international conference where you're bringing all these people in, you set up, um, you know, a little mini sewing factory. So the people come to the conference, take measurements on the spot, um, and then, so within, if it's a two, three day, usually people will come maybe for three, four days for a conference. They can have their measurements taken, and they can put in their orders, and maybe they can even get some clothes to take away. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we do it very informally. I'm sure all of us have had friends who came and said, oh, can you have things made for, for me? But I think we can do it in a more formal way as well. Um, that's what they do in Hong Kong, for example. So if you visit Hong Kong as a tourist, you can go to a tailor to order a suit. And before you leave, he has, um, he has delivered the suit to your hotel. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we can do that with our style of, you know, um, fashion and textiles and that kind of thing. And that will create a lot of employment as well. Yeah. I also see the opportunities in maybe documenting mm -hmm. our rich culture and history that yes. maybe have been overlooked. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. So I started off by talking about um, the slave, well, gold and then the slave trade and then colonialism. Um, and all this Ghana was at the center of and um, and then you had independence so the first country where um, the Europeans came to settle because of gold was the first country which became independent mm. so it went full circle mm. and Ghana's independence was attended by people from all over the world the whole African diaspora and beyond so you had Martin Luther King here for example um, our story inspired people like Nina Simone, Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. Malcolm X, Maya Angelou, who actually lived in Ghana. What did they do? They were so inspired, they went back to America to fight for their own rights. Ghana inspired the U.S. civil rights movement. People don't know this, and we haven't made much about it. But like you're rightly saying, we need to document. Some of the documentation is there. It's being lost. Mm -hmm. Haksa wants to help to preserve these documents. People have photographs. Old people might pass, and the photographs may end up being thrown away when they are of value. Film, there's um, reels of film documenting Ghana's history, which has not been digitized. We need to work on, on such projects. We need to put like, a, we, we need to create a museum because our history is documented in pho photography, the birth of the nation, and even to the extent that Ghana sent photographers to document, and, and, and um, videographers to document the birth of Kenya, for example. All this is heritage which is dormant, which we can be using um, in numerous ways to, to, to bring revenues, to employ people, um, to create um, places where people can visit. Even researchers have to pay money sometimes to, to get data. We have a lot of data which would be interested, uh, interesting to researchers and which they would pay for mm -hmm. if we can catalog and give access to. So there's a lot to be done. And so let's look into the future. What do you think needs to be done to turn our cultural economy around for it to be more significant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, one of the models I have observed, uh, especially in the US, is using nonprofits 
foundations, societies to safeguard um, heritage and culture. So I visited Mount Vernon, for example, and I was blown away by the expanse of the place, the way it is cared for, the way they have beautifully um, incorporated a museum underground so that because the, the museum is a modern building and they don't want it to spoil the landscape, so they have buried it under grass, actually. Um, it's also another museum on slavery because George Washington kept slaves. And they, because there are um, other s museums, um, in fact, the African American Museum um, in Washington, D.C., which was designed by a Ghanaian, um, Sir David Ajay, something we should be so proud of and even can um, benefit from uh, if we, uh, we, we think creatively. Um, so they focus on individual slaves who, or enslaved people who were kept by George Washington. And so that's the twist they give to their museum. So they have like cut out cardboard of his valet, cut out cardboard of the cook. Then they tell you about the cook, her children, when she came to the plantation, when she was sold away and, and things like that, just to, to, to make it real. And you can see the big house, you can see the slave quarters, um, even trees. Recently, they emailed that during the storm in March, a, a tree which was planted by George Washington had, been, had fallen. So they incorporate everything. And I found out that this, um, you can say, living museum was created by a society of women. And so I was, I was quite pleased because this is the kind of thing we are trying to do. We are trying to bring people together um, to protect heritage and culture. And we need support from the government um, in terms of understanding the role of non-profits and NGOs in this industry. Furthermore, the private sector is also very important. So some of our heritage sites, which have nothing, like the other day I was recommending that people go and uh, visit the Nkrumah Mausoleum, and I, it's on our tour, and I'm very proud to take people there. But the museum is not in very good shape. Um, and so, again, giving it out to a trust or, um, you know, on a short lease to a private contractor who um, builds it up, makes it economic, um, and can renew their lease. So if they do well, obviously the government will be making a lot of revenue if it's handled properly, and if it's not, then you can, uh, you don't renew the lease and you give it to somebody else who can, who has more expertise and who can do a better job. But um, it's, in my opinion, not a good idea that all significant tourist sites should be under government management. Um, government can profit share, but they should give it out to the specialist organizations to run. So in the future, I can see that being something which happens. And when that happens, if you have a booming um, site, booming in every way, there's a, a restaurant, there's a shop, um, there's the museum, there are the tour guides. Every, it, it means you are increasing employment, you are increasing revenues, um, and um, e even though whoever the contractor is is making money, I suspect the government will be making more money than when the whole site was purely under them. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. And on that note, I'd like to say you've really, really given us a great insight into the cultural economy and given us a lot of things to think about as well um, and I'd like to say thank you thank you a big thank you to you next week we'll have yet more conversations with IFS so we look forward to seeing you then